And our question from a listener today is, how is Labour responding to Rishi Sunak's anti-strike legislation? So Sunak wants to bring in minimum service requirements for key public sector areas like health, rail, firefighting, um, with the law enforceable in two different ways, allowing employers to fire workers who strike when they've been told not to strike and to sue unions that don't ensure a minimum level of service. There's all sorts of reasons why this might not work in practice. And our colleague, Ido Vok, who works in Europe, has written about how they have these laws in France, Spain and Italy, but still workers go on strike there. Um, but what is Labour's line on it? Because it's it's not really taking the line that it wants to defend the right to strike. No, and it's worth noting that the legislation itself is quite bare. Even though this was in the 2019 Conservative Manifesto, it does seem quite rushed. For instance, one of the key requirements is for ministers to set out what actually are minimum service requirements. <laughs> uh, so they have to do that with the companies and then the companies give the unions who have like a work notice which stipulates what they need to provide each day. So that's all to be worked out. And as you say, Andrew, it's got to get through Parliament mm-hmm. and lots of things. Mm-hmm. But it is interesting in how it changes the politics because we've had some tentative polling come out already that says there is perhaps support for it. But in the same poll, you still get the public blaming the government for the strikes and completely, I'm very negative about how they responded to it. So I'm I'm not sure Labour need to get too bogged down in this debate as long as they keep the focus on the government are responsible for this. They're the ones not um, having the conversations with the unions and they're the ones who have left the public sector in a state which requires strikes. So I think this is more about political positioning, sending messages, getting headlines than it is about actual workable legislation. Yes, and I think that's why Labour's going on the line. I think Streeting's called it the sacking the staff bill. Yeah. Uh, Starmer said in PMQs yesterday, you know, you're going from clapping nurses to sacking them. So they're really focusing on that attack on individual workers, which seems to be the thing that is least popular with the public. And while... Sunak is trying to use the line, he's calling it minimum safety legislation, even though that's not what it's actually called. So really playing up the idea that they're trying to protect the public with it. I think there is just such an open goal for Labour to say that we barely have minimum service at yeah. the moment. And you to know. be fair, they've, they have been kicking balls through it, haven't they? Yes, the they last have. few days, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and Andrew, what does this say about what kind of politician Sunak is? I mean, he's trying to give off this aura of a sort of reasonable managerial centrist. I think you called him a sort of Hindu nerdy numbers man. Yes, that's it. Dad. Hindu, Hindu uh, centrist dad and also a bit of, of a And of course a numbers geek. man. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, I'm the geek guy. You can trust me. I will, I will sort out the absolute chaos left behind by Boris Johnson yeah. and Liz Truss. That's my agenda. And I'm kind of mainstream sort of guy. But this week I've been talking to a wide range of people ranging from Neil Kinnock mm-hmm. through to Ken Clark. And they both made the point, those people, that actually Rishi Sunak is a right-wing conservative. He is not um, a sort of centre-ground conservative. Jeremy Hunt might be, but Rishi Sunak has always been on the Thatcherite edge of the party. He's very much small state in his background, his Californian background. He fundamentally doesn't believe that government should do much in many circumstances except get out of the way. That's where he's come from. Now, we haven't seen very much of that. But looking ahead, when we're asking ourselves through 2023, what is Rishi Sunak's vision for Britain? That is going to be a more and more interesting question. Is he really actually a Singaporean, you know, uh, less regulation, smaller state kind of conservative, cut taxes, you know, cut the welfare bill? That seems to be where he's coming from. And if he's not that... What is he? Mm. Yeah, I think it is important to look at his ideology and understand where he is coming from. But there are so many constraints on him at the moment, it doesn't even really matter. I I went through uh, all the government bills that are going through Parliament last night for morning call, and there are about 25 of them. And it's very hard to pinpoint one, which they can go to the public in 24, 25, and say, look, this is what we've achieved. So many of them are basically responding to crises, whether it's the the minimum service bill, yeah, the repair of lots of different (laughs) things that aren't going to be able to create a narrative for Sunak, in part because he's inherited all these bills. Mm. And then he's got rid of many of the reforms that Liz Truss Truss wanted to bring about, but he hasn't uh, suggested an alternative. So I think that's going to cause him problems just because he hasn't got something to sell to the public, but it's also going to cause him problems with his party as well. I mean, he has, has a sufficient number of loyal MPs in his government to keep going. That's why he has a government. That's why we're not having resignations and the briefing isn't as extreme as it has been for the past nine months. But as soon as we get, you know, a very bad set of local election results, perhaps in May, you know, even if he doesn't give them enough um, to corral around in the budget, then he might have some problems down the line. And all of that basically means that he doesn't have the opportunity to 
implement those beliefs and say to the public, this is what I believe in and this is the sort of country I want to create. Yeah, it's sort of the great yeah. irony of Rishi Sunak's chancellorship and premiership, isn't it? He's never been able to act no. on those sort of Silicon Valley-ish uh, instincts uh, that he Fred has. Fred is quite right. He has always been constrained. Um, and when I was saying, what, what's his vision for the country? Um, he has to, I think he has to move reasonably fast because there are other people prepared to stand, you know, to come into the yeah. gap. We had a certain Boris <laughs> de Feffel Johnson <laughs> talking at the Carlton Club this week, um, uh, proclaiming the need for low tax, new, you know, revived low tax uh, conservatism uh, and all of that. Um, something that is completely implausible. The, the idea that they could be cutting mm. taxes at this stage is absolutely nuts, I think. But mm. nonetheless, there's all that manoeuvring around. Johnson's got his outriders, Nadine Doris and, and others, inside the Conservative Party already. And I think Freddie is right. The, the maximum moment of danger this year will come quite early in May after those local election results, which are bound to be bad for the Conservatives. I think if Johnson and co uh, try to oust Rishi Sunak, it really is game over for the Conservatives for the next 10 or 20 years because I think another attempt to change the Prime Minister at that stage would be seen by the public not only as ridiculous, but unbelievably selfish and myopic mm. and uninterested in, in the future of the country. Nonetheless, it may well happen.